Let's talk about protecting human subjects data in XNAP. The rules for working with human subjects data have gotten much more extensive in the last decade, requiring researchers to be much more conscious about what data they collect, how it's stored, and what they can publish. In this unit, we're going to explore these rules and how they affect human subjects research and how they affect your job as an XNet administrator. And we'll talk about the tools that are available to help you deal with them. First, let's look briefly at these rules. For research in the US, the HIPAA privacy rule and safe harbor guidelines for de-identification apply. In the UK and the, and the EU, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, applies. And in a collaborative study with global partners, you may have multiple overlapping policies and requirements to deal with, including restrictions on sharing data across borders. As an XNet admin, you are thrust into the middle of this fight. Your system is going to be used to store human subjects' research data, and you ultimately have the power to administer each user's access. If a privacy breach occurs, you will be right in the thick of the aftermath. Before we talk about the tools at your disposal, let's review terms and techniques. First, here's a list of the 18 types of human subjects data that HIPAA terms as identifying. I've highlighted these last three because they can get very dicey for handling image sessions and subject data in general. Is a three-dimensional scan that can be reconstructed to show a face considered a photograph? Are the measured regions of the brain as individually identifiable as a fingerprint? And is a subject ID in your XNet considered a prohibited unique identifying number? The answers to these questions often depend on institutional policy. I can't give you precise prescriptive guidance here, only anecdotes of how we've seen these questions answered in the various projects that we've supported. It's also worth noting that the GDPR recognizes each of these HIPAA identifiers, but they also take pains to call out behavioral identifiers, where an individual's identity could potentially be revealed through an analysis of habitual behavior. For example, someone with a daily commute where that commute data is tracked on Google Maps. Some clinical behavioral data could be considered identifying, particularly if it's combined with other information. In terms of techniques, let's talk briefly about the difference between anonymization, de-identification, and pseudonymization. Anonymization means to completely destroy the identifying data and its link back to the subject. For example, if you have a social security number embedded into ICOM metadata, you would want to remove it completely. Or, in public data reporting of patients with similar tumors, for example, reporting on them in the aggregate rather than individually removes any possibility of identifying individuals in the study. For example, you might say, for 50 patients with similar tumors, they shared these characteristic responses to treatment. De-identification, which is the HIPAA term, and pseudonymization, which is the term in GDPR, have similar meanings to each other, where instead of destroying identifying data, you replace it with a coded alternative. An example of this would be a coded subject ID in place of a patient name, where you retain a unique identity for each subject for the purposes of associating experiments with them, but the ID itself does not reveal the patient's identity. In the course of these lectures, we often use the term anonymization as a shorthand to refer to both anonymization and de-identification, or pseudonymization, such as when we talk about an anon script. This, uh, these scripts can perform both functions. But we will get specific when we're talking about dealing with specific identifiers. Now that we have these terms defined, let's talk about how we deal with them in XNAP. 